I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome to my newly renovated dining room. So my wife and I bought this house about two and a half years ago and we bought it because it has a nice view and a big workshop. And we consider ourselves very fortunate to be able to live in a house as nice as this one. With that said, we wanted to update the styling a little bit. As you can see, it's dated. Nice skateboard. So I got started by installing four can lights. And the little dots on the ceiling are rare earth magnets to help me locate the ceiling joists. Certainly is winter time in Denver. After the lights were installed, I patched the holes that I'd cut in the drywall when installing the lights, and I also smooth textured the walls. I think in the industry it's called a level five. Doing this is not real hard, but it does take a ton of time. I had to skim the walls with two full coats, and then I did a half a coat on the third time around. And the job was made much easier by the shop apprentice. So just a quick backstory on why I decided to do this project. Normally December is a pretty slow month for my business, so that affords me the opportunity to either take some time off or work on the house. And my wife suggested, why don't we remodel the dining room and try and have it ready for Christmas dinner? So I took a look at my schedule and I found out that my last install prior to the holidays was December 6th. So I could start on December 7th and have it ready by December 24th. And looking back, I can hardly say that sentence with a straight face. But at the time, it seemed like a good plan. So I ended up finishing the project on January 1st. And you might be asking yourself, why the delays, Mike? Well, the shop apprentice decided to get an ear infection. So I had to keep an eye on him for about a week. And I didn't get a whole lot of work done during that time. So after prepping all the walls, I decided to throw a coat of primer up and get to the actual woodworking part of this project. I think it's always best to work from the top down, so I got started by installing some crown molding. And here I'm just holding up a thin rip of some MDF, and it's a known length, so it makes it a little easier to measure out walls when you're alone. When I'm installing moldings, I like to measure all the walls all at one time, and I carry a trusty notepad with me to write everything down on. And I make all the cuts at the same time as well, and usually I don't have too many recuts. Installing crown molding alone is always a little tricky, and this is my method for not having a second set of hands. And to hold the crown molding up in the corners, I'm using two different tools. One's called a third hand by FastCap, and the other is called a zip wall. And you may notice that I'm using a miter cut for the corner joints rather than a cope. And I've just had real good luck with miter joints. As long as I use glue and it's a nice tight fit, I haven't had a joint open up yet. And I've probably installed a few miles of crown molding in the last, you know, 15 years or so. And I always add glue to both sides of the joint, as you can see I'm doing here. And I think the glue is really what helps prevent that joint from opening up. And don't misunderstand, I'm not opposed to the cope joint. I've just had good luck with miters and their... A little easier and a little faster to cut than cope joints. So this tool I'm using here is the zip wall and it has like a spring-loaded pad and that really helps for pressing the crown molding to the ceiling. Here I'm using a spring-loaded nail set to just countersink all the nails. I don't know why I love that tool so much. I think it was only eight bucks but it's one of my favorites. I found myself doing touch-up work every time the light in the room changed. So this is my prep kit consists of some joint compound, some acrylic latex caulk, a bucket, a rag, a little bit of water, and this is what I use for all of my touch-up work after installation. And I don't know about you guys, but I usually spend more time filling nail holes, sanding, and caulking gaps than I actually do installing the crown molding. The only way I've found to get that done any faster is just to hire somebody but that wasn't gonna happen on this project. When it's my house, I have this weird thing about I have to do every last detail myself. I don't know why, pride of ownership or something. So the ceiling's got two coats of flat white. It's uh, Sherwin-Williams color number 7005. And I use that same color for all the moldings, but in semi-gloss. It was really nice to get this done because this was the first finished surface of the project. It's nice to kind of see things start to come together. After the ceiling was painted, it was time to head back out to the shop this is a classic single-digit Denver morning. I think winter is the most beautiful season. 
So not counting the bay window, the room is 14 feet by 12, so I needed to order some extra long material. So my next move was to make the window and door jams, and I do those out of a combination of MDF and solid wood. A better way to put that is everything's made out of MDF except for the window sills. So my process is to rip out a bunch of strips to the appropriate width, and then I will put a little round over on all the show edges, and then I take them into the finishing booth and give them a coat of primer. Here I'm just notching the window sills. Really is nice to have a bandsaw to do this. I'm used to being on site and having to do this with either a handsaw or a jigsaw. I always like to round over the edges of millwork. Uh, when woodworking's in a house, it tends to take a beating and a real sharp corner will show a dent much more readily than one that's just slightly rounded over. So as I mentioned earlier, my wife and I have owned this house for about two and a half years. And this is really the first project where I'm sort of improving the look of the house. For the last couple of years, uh, you know, most of the work I've been doing on this thing has just been repairs and replacing old worn out parts and plumbing and heaters. And um, this felt really nice to be able to kind of tackle something and make the house look a little prettier. I get made fun of for this, but I always like to mark my setbacks when I'm installing moldings around window and door jams. So you may notice that the shots keep going from light to dark and dark to light. Well, after my shop apprentice got his ear infection and I knew I was behind schedule, I was really pushing hard to try and get this thing done by a Christmas Eve dinner we were supposed to host. And I ended up working pretty late into the night on a handful of occasions. So for this type of work, I like to have the smallest air compressor that I can buy. And if you see over in the right hand corner, there's a tiny little Cinco air compressor. It's perfect for this kind of work. And I'm switching between two nail guns, uh, a 15 gauge angled nail gun made by Hitachi that has been an awesome tool, and an 18 gauge Porter Cable nail gun that shoots up to two inch uh, 18 gauge brads. So after the casing was in around the doors and windows, it was time to move on to the wainscoting, or some people call it board and batten. And here you can see our paint sample, as well as a, just a quick mock-up that I did of the wainscoting layout. And of course the shop apprentice left his mark there as well. So back in the shop, I got started by ripping out some four inch strips and some four and a half inch strips for the bottom rail of the wainscoting. So here's a quick pro tip. I have my outfeed set so that when I'm ripping sheets of plywood, as it goes past the blade, it wants to tip off the end of the saw, which makes it really easy to grab and then stack up. So up to now, I don't think it was too noticeable, but at some time during the course of this project, I got frustrated with my camera lens and I decided to buy a wide angle lens and here it is on display in the shop. Having a nice flip stop on your chop saw setup really makes projects like this faster and more accurate. For the last minute or two, I'm sure you guys have been thinking, who does this guy kind of look like? And this is me doing my best impression of Bane from The Dark Knight Rises. So once again, I pull out my trusty EdgeTech sanding disc to prep all the edges of these parts. And next, I moved on to layout. And it's critical to get a good layout on this. Each of the walls will have a slightly different spacing between the vertical uprights. So take your time and really think about this. Also consider placement of outlets and light switches and make sure that there's not gonna be any odd interference. I'm using half inch thick material for the paneling portion of this project. And I chose a half inch thickness because um, I didn't want the paneling to stick out past the window and door casing. And in this particular project, I chose 7 eighths of an inch for the window and door casing. And I'm going to apply a 1 eighth inch back to this half inch material. So there'll be a quarter inch setback between the thickness of the window and door casing and the wall paneling itself. For this kind of work, there's just nothing better than biscuits and glue. And for those of you who've never used a biscuit joiner, it's unique in that it aligns the parts, I guess, in a vertical fashion very accurately but it offers a little bit of play left and right. And that can really be used to your advantage when you're assembling big panels like this. 
So when putting an assembly together like this, making sure that glue is on the entire joint is real important to preventing the joint from opening up uh, years down the line. So I always make sure to use ample glue and I spread it out thoroughly on the joint. So here I'm just milling up some of that long stock for the two longer runs of wall paneling. And I think I could plane about 12 foot pieces um, with the garage door down, but when it gets any longer than that, I gotta open up the garage door. And this shot here is a perfect example of how you could never have a big enough workbench. My workbench top here is four feet by eight feet. And when I put the parts up on the bench, it just looks tiny. So having some sawhorses around and maybe a sheet of plywood laying around to make a temporary workbench is always a good idea. So as per usual, I have my noise canceling earbuds in and in this particular case, I pulled out an old album and by pulled out an old album, I mean I loaded it onto my iPod. Uh, I pulled out an old album uh, by the Scorpions called Love Drive and there's a particular song on there called Coast to Coast and if you like guitar songs that's a good song and I suggest you give it a listen especially if you're a fan of the rock and or roll music. Here's a nice close-up shot of the effort that I put into spreading glue around. I put a little bit on the top edge of the biscuit joint and a little bit on the bottom edge and then I smeared around the whole piece as well. So here's another shot of my new wide-angle camera lens. And I'm cutting out 1 8 inch material for the backs and this is really the first time I've cut 1 8 inch MDF and I'll tell you what, it's like cutting a sheet of paper, it's really flimsy and not easy to manhandle. But as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to make sure to keep the wall paneling as thin as possible so the 1 8 inch really was the best choice for this particular project. Ooh, here's a treat, a very rare appearance by my wife into the wood shop. There she is. Say hi, everybody. Is that right? Moving on to attaching the backs, glue and pin nails. Since I'm using 1 8 inch MDF and 1 half inch MDF, it's important to make sure that you have a nail gun that shoots short enough nails. This is always a fun dance trying to set the piece down so that you don't smear and expose any of the glue. So here's a trick I picked up a few years ago. I like to use a router bit with a little itty bitty bearing. And um, this router bit's made by Amana. And that small bearing allows you to get further into the corners and I think it creates a more professional appearance. Once the panels were all put together and routed and sanded, it was time for some primer. At this point, the panels have all been assembled and primed. I've also given them a quick sanding. And the next step is to start hanging them on the walls. To get started with that process, I make all of the cutouts for the light switches and outlets. This is a point in the project where you can really, really cost yourself if you cut these wrong. So certainly measure four times and cut once. So I learned this little trick from a guy installing shower paneling and he said when you're putting construction adhesive on the wall, make uh, circles and that'll create a little bit of a suction so that when you squish the panel into the glue, it'll have a better chance of holding on. So there it is, the first panel installed. Rock out! So I will share with you an embarrassing secret. Only one time in my career so far have I made something that was actually too big to get into the house that I was supposed to deliver it to. And I promised myself that I would never make that mistake again. So prior to making this panel, I did measure my walking spaces and I made sure that I could get it in and get it installed. I like to use the classic tapping method to find the location of the studs. 
Hopefully you can hear the change in pitch as I get over top of the stud. So I was lucky enough to be able to move the junction box over a few inches so that it wouldn't interfere with one of the verticals of the wall paneling. Sometimes you get lucky and there's enough slack in the wires and other times you can't move it over and you just have to deal with it. I sign all of my work. I think it's important. Look at that excellent penmanship. Really like these Japanese style pole saws. They're absolutely excellent for scribing. Just mark your line, cut to it, and then I use a hand plane just to kind of clean it up a little bit, make sure it fits perfect. Always fit the easiest pieces last. It's way easier to scribe a small panel like this than it is the larger ones. So put the large one in first and then work on the smaller ones. So I knew fitting this bay window area was going to be a real challenge. And rather than trying to build a panel in the shop and somehow fit it up against this wall, I just decided to go ahead and make the pieces in and install them in place. Here I'm just making all of the various cuts needed to fit these styles around the window casing. So in this shot I'm adding glue to the inside joint and in my work I do spend a lot of time properly gluing pieces together and one of the lessons I've learned over the years, probably a lesson I've learned too many times, is if you don't add glue to a joint like this, it'll look good for say six months or a year and then when the seasons change and the humidity levels change, expansion, contraction, that joint will open up and it'll look like a weekend warrior did it, not a professional. So it was at this point in the project that I kind of decided I made a mistake. I just decided that I didn't like that little small area between the window casing and the vertical member of the wall paneling. So I decided I would make those corner pieces a little wider so that they would just butt up against the window casing. So here I'm just remaking those corner pieces and I decided to make them six inches wide instead of four inches wide. Here's another area where biscuits do really good and that's helping with alignment when you're clamping angles together. So let's see how this new wider corner joint looks. I definitely think it's a compromise, but it looks a little bit better in my opinion. And when doing this kind of woodworking in a house, there's just always compromises. You know, things aren't framed even, the windows aren't perfectly centered. There's always compromises and you just have to do the best that you can. So here's another little trick I like to use the biscuit joiner for, and that's cutting a slot. This is a pretty cool trick. It allows you to kind of slide two pieces together with a biscuit in between them. And I'll show how I use this trick in just another second. So here I've glued a couple biscuits into the vertical pieces and then I add a little glue to the slot that I've cut in the horizontal piece and I slide it down into place. Fits like a glove. What's that ghostly figure in the window? So when and where possible, I like to use a small handsaw like this one to fit parts. And it might feel a little slower when you're cutting versus say a chop saw, but it does save you walking around to your table saw or your chop saw setup. So as long as you could measure and mark accurately and then cut to your lines, uh, I definitely recommend using a small handsaw to fit parts. And I really like the detail of having the chair rail overhang the casing just a little bit. I think it really just makes everything tie together very nicely. I first saw that detail in an old arts and crafts home that I worked on years back. Getting down to the finishing touches here.
And I use the same trick that I used to measure the crown molding to measure for the base molding as well. And I'm not sure you can see it too good in this shot, but I had the base molding overhang the door casing this by the same amount as the chair rail. I don't think it's possible to overstress the importance of proper prep before paint. Um, filling nail holes and sanding them, caulking, touching up the primer, all these things are absolutely critical to achieving a good finish when it's all said and done. And a couple quick tips that I'd like to share that I've picked up over the years is one, you want to use a damp rag when you're applying caulking and kind of keep your finger a little bit damp as you're spreading the caulking out. And then second is when you're filling nail holes, fill them, uh, you know, put a little of the filler on your finger and then press it into the nail hole and leave it a little proud and then let it dry and then sand it off. And that will really create a nice, perfectly flat surface for paint. So after all the prep is complete, it's time to mask the room off and get ready for a spray finish. So I didn't want to have to spray this whole project with an HVLP gun and an air compressor. So I decided I'd pick up one of these little small handheld airless sprayers. This one's called the Graco Ultra and it's the corded model. And I must say I was quite impressed with this tool. It works incredibly well. It spits out a good amount of paint fast and uh, overall I'm real happy with my purchase. By this point I was getting pretty excited. I had seen enough of the project to know that I was pretty happy with the results. Looking sharp. So I always go back and forth between which is better, taping or just cutting by hand. And in this case I decided to cut by hand because the paint on the moldings and the wainscoting and all that was still basically wet. So uh, I just decided to press on and try and get this project done a little bit faster, and I cut by hand. These two shots are a perfect example of how paint can be very deceiving when it goes on one color and then it dries a different color. If you look at the wall on the right, that's dried, and then where I'm painting is obviously wet. So when it was all said and done and all the final details were completed, I must say I was quite pleased with the end result and so was my wife. Now that this project is complete, I'm not sure food will taste any better in here or conversation will be any better. But I don't know, you know, maybe it will be. Why do you feel better when you put on a suit or for you ladies a dress? All I know is I'm looking forward to eating meals with my family entertaining friends, maybe sharing a bottle of wine, playing board games, arguing politics, you know, all the things you do at a dining room. And I hope in some small way taking the time to complete this project will add to those experiences. I don't know, maybe that's just wishful thinking, but it sure was a fun project to work on. And I'm really happy that you followed along and I can share this journey with you. Thanks for watching. Till next time.